Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we've got a great program. We've got some folks who are coming over pretty soon to share their perspectives. Uh, and we're here, as you know, to share with you our policy agenda um, aimed at putting the US in position to meet the 2030 Thank you very much. Um, excellent, that's much better. I don't feel like I'm one of, one of those uh, science um, tests where you hear yourself talking. So we're here uh, to share with you our US policy agenda uh, for the next few years with the aim of meeting the very ambitious American commitment to cut emissions 50 to 52% below 2005 levels by 2030 and to reach net zero emissions by mid-century. Uh, I'm Nat Cohan. I'm the president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, and really glad to have everybody here today in the room and also online. When C2ES was formed 25 years ago, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary today, or this, this year, we also founded the Business Environmental Leadership Council, or BELC, with the goal of integrating the experience and expertise of the private sector into the design and advocacy of strong and ambitious and effective climate policies. The BELC brings together over 40, mostly Fortune 500 companies from across the economy and allows us to help align US competitiveness and a robust economy with the vision of a thriving, just, and resilient net zero future. Um, we draw on those relationships with businesses throughout our work as we work to accelerate the net zero transition in the U.S., to support the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and to build climate resilience and a stronger economy across the United States. Those deep ties with our business council and more broadly with a range of other companies were integral in developing the policy priorities underlying our discussions today. Their input, the input of those companies is critical to our success and the quality of our policy positions. What we're presenting today, we have worked on and we've, we've worked on for four months and almost back to the IRA South Lawn celebration in the White House um, through intensive workshop discussions with dozens of companies. The advantage gained by engaging those companies is that our policy recommendations have already benefited from significant stakeholder input and expertise even before we get to today's announcement. And while the policy agenda we're releasing today represents our views alone, we think that our approach makes for better policy. And our experience is, is, is that the process leads to stronger advocacy and partnership from the companies we work with. You'll see that same blueprint throughout our program today as we hear from the CEO of Edison International and a business panel of representatives from Wholesome US, Exelon and Ford Motor Company. We'll also hear from members of Congress beginning in just a minute. Um, but let me offer briefly some broader context. We've all celebrated the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the largest ever US investment in climate uh, and build in, 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 in addressing climate change and building a strong low carbon economy. Um, we also saw the bipartisan infrastructure package passed last year and the Chips and Science Act passed this year. And all together, those are expected to lead to a 32 to 42% reduction in US emissions by 2030. That's a tremendous win and we should celebrate it. But we also need to recognize that we can't rest on our laurels. And e even that 42%, if we reach that, is still well short of the target. The urgency of the climate crisis and the enormous opportunity represented by the low carbon transition demand that we resist the Washington temptation to check the box and move on. So that's why we're here today. Uh, we've got a set of 46 policy recommendations that you'll hear Brad Townsend talk through in a little bit. Um, we've got the business panel and the CEO keynote that I mentioned as well. Uh, but uh, first of all, I want to start by um, in, I want to start by introducing our next. Uh, Alec, is she ready to go? Uh, let me start by introducing um, our our first speaker. Um, we are very pleased to have with us Congresswoman Marionette Miller Meeks, who proudly represents the first congressional district of Iowa. Uh, Representative Miller Meeks has served in Congress since 2018 following a career in the U.S. Army as a private nurse and doctor. 
Representative Miller Meeks is also a member of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and serves on the subcommittee. She joined a congressional CODEL to COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh just a few months ago. We're very pleased to have you with us, Congressman, to talk about strong climate policies and clean energy investments. Thank you so much. Thank Welcome. you so much. behind the podium, obviously. So can you all hear me okay? Do we have any recording devices I need to be concerned about? Uh, so if I can, just a small correction. So I was elected to the Iowa State Senate in 2018. I was elected to Congress in 2020. I don't want to be a purveyor of misinformation. Um, uh, and then uh, I'm also a uh, vice chair of the Conservative Climate Caucus. So it's uh, really uh, a pleasure uh, to be able to speak with you today. Uh, I was just in Houston last week speaking to the U.S. Global Energy Stream, actually about renewables. Um, I went to both COP26 and COP27. Uh, and when there was a little bit of concern from my political team about going to uh, COP26, um, I said, if you're worried about how I talk with uh, climate and the environment and energy among Republicans or conservatives, I'm just going to tell Iowa's story. So I'm going to tell you Iowa's story, uh, because when I joined Energy and Commerce, I told Texas, Louisiana, and Ohio to look out. Iowa's an energy state. So most of you think of Iowa as an agricultural state. Uh, Iowa has 50% of its energy from renewables. We have over 50%. Now the total is about 58% of our electricity from wind, and we are a net exporter of energy. And we have any of the above renewables. So we have ethanol, biodiesel, biomass, manure. Yes, you heard me correctly, manure, uh, which has a variety of uses. So it's really fascinating how you can uh, use that as both fertilizer and energy and the heat uh, from uh, digesters. Uh, we have wind and solar. We had a nuclear power plant uh, just uh, um, to the west of Cedar Rapids, which actually provided electricity during the uh, huge floods in 2008 for Cedar Rapids, but that closed two years ago before we figured out a mechanism to, um, to be able to save that. And I think what's important when you're talking about the renewable space is um, Number one, we should be talking about admissions and we should be energy source agnostic. And why do I say that? Because we know demand for energy is going up. Demand for energy is only increasing, it is not decreasing. There is only so much that we can do on energy efficiency. Number one, energy efficiency isn't going to meet the energy demands of today, much less the energy demands of the future. So when we look at this wonderful uh, project we have in the United States called federalism, states need to have the ability and the flexibility to produce energy that makes sense for their state. So in Iowa, it certainly makes sense for us to do ethanol, to do biodiesel, and you know, one, biodiesel from soy, two, from uh, used cooking oil, three, from rendering, because we have livestock. So we have a lot of sources for energy from that. We also have compressed renewable natural gas uh, that you can get from the stover. You don't even have to use the kernel, kernel, corn kernel or soybean kernel. Um, wind and solar, it makes sense. So, but other states, so Texas, wind, solar makes sense as well as um, uh, carbon-based fuels. Uh, in California, solar may make a lot of sense. Washington state, hydropower makes a lot of sense. So states should be able to use the energy sources that make sense. And then what we haven't talked about is, of course, platforms for nuclear, especially small modular reactors. Uh, we know from uh, COP26 and our conversations, the DOD is going to do a portable small nuclear reactor, I think 2024, maybe 2025, the sooner the better to me, um, that you can reuse spent fuel rods. And there's also a variety of sources. And then innovation, which we haven't even talked about, which 20 years ago, we talked a lot about hydrogen. And I think as we started uh, subsidizing solar and wind, we talked less about hydrogen. But two breakthroughs, one, a Lawrence Livermore lab, you know, there was a breakthrough in fusion, and then a renewed focus at hydrogen, and then how can you use green hydrogen or uh, splitting uh, hydrogen or water mo molecules using um, uh, renewable sources of energy. So I think the horizon is just full of potential, full of innovation, uh, if we put the mind to research and development and new sources of energy. Now, I'm not going to say that I know how to do that. I'm just a doctor. Um, I'm not smart enough to figure that out. I actually think we have a congressional art challenge. 
We have a congressional app challenge. We really should have a congressional energy challenge for young people and research facilities that are looking at what's the next source of energy. Uh, and we have challenges within our country. Um, we know that there has been a lot of money pushed into uh, cleaner sources of energy, but yet we don't have the permitting that allows us to mine for critical elements. Um, and we also know that you know cobalt, copper, lithium, there are things that are here that are uh, you know part of the you know wonderful geography of the United States that we have available to us, but we're not allowing permits for those to be resourced here in the United States. And it'll be interesting that the Chinese Communist Party will probably benefit from some of the credits uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of potential, but there are also things that we have we want to do. Uh, in Iowa, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that we're looking at is pipelines in order to do carbon uh, sequestration, carbon capture sequestration. One of the byproducts of ethanol, ethanol development produces much more than ethanol. They produce dried distilled grains or DDGs. Um, we always use a lot of acronyms in the military and in government. So if I use an acronym that you don't know, just let me know. Um, but we have dry distilled grains, you have starches, you have sugars, you have corn syrup, you have corn oil, you also have CO2. Most of the CO2, uh, if anybody's drinking a carbonated beverage, those carbonated beverages, that CO2 or dry ice may come from an ethanol plant. But the CO2 that is not uh, captured and used, and we're actually looking at other markets for CO2, but also looking at uh, putting it underground and storing it. Uh, and you can store it for um, hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's been done, it actually works, um, and that would make ethanol uh, carbon negative. So interesting enough, working and partnering, partnering with our um, you know, uh, carbon-based fuels, our liquid fuel industry, how we're going to morph that. Uh, and so when we're looking at permitting changes and we're looking at pipelines, we also, I think, have some synergy with our partners on the other side of the aisle who want transmission lines. And we know if you're trying to have an electrified grid, if you're trying to do electrification for the transportation sector, if you're trying to take electricity that's made with wind and solar, you have to transport it and those transmission lines are longer. Uh, they have to be stronger, uh, you know, more resilient. Uh, and so transmission lines are gonna have the same problem as pipelines and that is property and imminent domain. So I think that we should look at, and we've, I think one of your speakers coming up next, we're having these conversations about what things we can do, partnering together so that both sides get things that they're looking for and they want. And then lastly, I'm gonna say that we, what we haven't talked about, but important in transmission lines as well, and that is in self-generation. And that brings up a whole new concept of how we think of utilities. Um, and I have good relations with the utility companies in our state, but we have, um, you know, people that self-generate, they sell electricity back to the grid, either from wind or solar. And then what do we do when we have transmission lines where electrons are going both ways? And how do we, um, you know, what's the process of paying people for generating electricity, which may reduce peaks, but who pays for the transmission lines, who pays for the transformers, who pays for repairs? So uh, no matter where you live, you have some kind of weather event, whether it's ice in the, the south or southeast, uh, or whether it's snow, lines come down and someone has to repair those. Uh, if it's hur hurricanes or tornadoes, someone has to go in to repair those lines and do it in a way that it's expeditious and gets people back uh, the energy they need. So I think in the uh, renewable space, in the clean energy space, I think that we have a lot of options going forward, but we need to recognize we have an increased energy demand how are we going to supply that increased energy demand while keeping people in the comfortable lifestyle that they have and lead us to a cleaner, healthier planet for our children and grandchildren while we compete economically around the globe? Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. That was terrific. And so much of what you mentioned, um, you know, range energy sources, including nuclear, clean energy, uh, clean hydrogen, pipelines and permitting, all of those things are a core part of our recommendations today. And so it's terrific to see that maybe we're hitting the mark. And, and of course, C2S is committed to working with the Conservative Climate Caucus and, and you as well. Um, let me ask, as the Vice Chairwoman of the caucus, 
you mentioned so much that needs to be done. Uh, can you share a sense of your top one or two priorities uh, for the coming to Congress? So I think, uh, you know, one of our top priorities is permitting. And I think this is something that both sides of the aisle want. Uh, John Curtis and I, Representative Curtis and I are having those conversations uh, with uh, members on the other side of the aisle to find out where it is that we have synergy and where we can go. So I know both for uh, the Republican Conference, but also for the Conservative Climate Caucus, uh, that is uh, a top priority is permitting. Um, and then next is going to be um, elements and where we can get elements. Uh, so if, uh, you know, currently, uh, for me, it, it's uh, I want a life cycle, carbon life cycle for uh, all energy production, and then we can go on from there to other products. Uh, and I think it's something the United States can lead in. I won't necessarily say that that's Representative Curtis's priority, um, but when we're looking at clean sources of energy, um, you know, where we get those elements from. So I was at the Ames Laboratory. It's one of our national laboratories. It's on the campus of uh, Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. And so they are recycling critical minerals. And so I was just talking to Senator Ernst today about how we can get more cleaned hard drives to them where they can recycle magnets and uh, using magnets, uh, recycle uh, critical minerals, uh, mining for critical minerals, how well we do mining here that we're in environmentally safe. We don't use safe uh, slave labor. Um, but when you look at this part of trying to increase clean energy, we want those solar panels made in the United States. Uh, we want access to copper in the United States or lithium in the United States. And then innovation. I, I think all of us uh, can think about um, you know, the, what it takes to get certain elements out of the ground in order to produce a renewable source of energy and it's massive, the amount of earth that has to be removed, the refining process. Uh, so um, doing that in the United States makes sense to do it here and how we can do it in the safest, cleanest way possible. Uh, thank you. If, if you have, um, can I ask one quick question? I know we've got to get you going in a minute, but you, I love that you leaned in on energy as, as Iowa. There's so many forms of energy. It's also, of course, agricultural state, the farm bill coming up this year. Any highlights that we should be thinking about to make sure that farming and agriculture and land use are part of the solution? Uh, you know, I think one of the, the neatest things about um, Iowa and its agri, as I said, people think of us as an agricultural state. We certainly are, and we're an energy state. So we've used those resources in order to, um, you know, to produce energy, to do both things. So we, we in Iowa, say that we feed and fuel the world. We actually do that. There'll be things in the farm bill that are very important. I mean, um, but even just working with um, other countries. So uh, we were at a, a trip with Senator Ernst, uh, Representative Randy Feenstra and I in Mexico, we were looking at border and then fentanyl coming across the border. But when we were meeting with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we took the opportunity to talk about genetically modified crops uh, and GMOs and how they're, um, you know, they're so beneficial in what we're doing. And on the energy front, I'm gonna put in a plug for biochar. So. It's one of my favorite things, biochar. So for those of you who don't know, look it up, but it's an opportunity to help us with a cleaner uh, planet using agriculture. Um, and it's more than just using, you know, corn kernels or soybean, because people say, why would you take food and make fuel? But you can use the stover. Do not call it waste. Farmers don't like you to call it waste. Um, but you can use that to create energy, biogas, um, bioasphalt, and then uh, biochar, which you can put on no-till, um, and in these conservation practices, I'm hoping we have some more of that, whether it's no-till, cover crops within the farm bill as well, too. Well, Congressman Miller-Meeks, Congresswoman Miller-Meeks, thank you so much for, for sharing those priorities and for coming to speak with us today. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. So in a little bit, we will be joined as well by Congressman Scott Peters of California. Um, before, before that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Brad Townsend, uh, who's the Vice President of Policy and Outreach at C2ES and has been at C2ES for five years now and, and led the work on this. And I just want to tee this up briefly by saying this: the, the recommendations you're going to hear, they encompass new policies as well as, uh, as are entirely new policies, as well as things we need to do to jumpstart the IRA. They encompass legislative and administrative action, and they encompass things we think we can get done with a divided Congress as well as those that uh, may, we may need to lay the groundwork for and build support for. Uh, so to walk you through some of those recommendations, uh, please welcome Brad Townsend. Thank you, Brad. 
Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. It is nice to be in person again uh, for an event. So thank you all for coming. Uh, as Nat mentioned, uh, we're delighted to release today's brief, Reaching for 2030, Climate and Energy Priorities. I'm honored, frankly, to present this work today um, and, and all the work that has been done by the team, as well as the input uh, of the companies who participated in this process, graciously uh, offering their time and perspective as we try to identify a set of recommendations that could really move uh, the ball forward, uh, both in terms of climate and also our broader economic development objectives. In particular, I'd like to highlight, I'm not sure he's in the room, he might be outside um, taking care of something else, but Jason Yi, uh, our Director of US uh, Policy and Outreach, is really uh, deserves a tremendous amount of credit for, for getting this thing across the finish line. Um, as Nat mentioned, the 117th Congress produced historic legislation um, that will make important investments in emissions reductions, as well as uh, the long-term competitiveness of our economy. However, as Nat also mentioned, there's a lot more to do um, to not only meet our, our 2030 uh, NDC, but also the longer term goal of net zero uh, emissions by 2050. And so back uh, a few months ago, as Nat mentioned, we launched a process with companies to really identify the next steps moving forward. Um, the uh, thing that I would like to, uh, I guess, maybe start by underscoring that Nat mentioned is that there are really three themes uh, that are that run throughout the brief. The first of which is really making sure that IRA implementation is done in a way that is effective and can really maximize the potential of that legislation. The second theme uh, is, of course, identifying uh, additional legislative needs. Uh, it's great to see the IRA done. The job is not finished. And so really uh, leaned into, in, in the development of this brief, what needs to happen from here. Uh, the third is really a, a set of executive branch actions, uh, both regulatory as well as agency uh, work that can be done uh, to help uh, not only level the playing field, but to support investment at scale. And so the recommendations themselves, uh, I will try not to, to, to put everybody to sleep by going through a laundry list here, um, but really there are uh, four key priority areas that we identified early in conversations with companies that were going to be important to being able to achieve our goals. Uh, the first of which uh, is investment. Uh, and so as we think about how to drive private investment at scale, it's really which is really going to be necessary to deploy these technologies across the entire economy. Uh, the International Energy Agency uh, estimates we'll need roughly $3 trillion of additional investment above and beyond today's investment by 2050 to meet those, those net zero goals. Uh, this is going to take a, a significant amount of private capital. And so that was a real focus in the development of the brief. Uh, the first section, and there are actually four section, sections excuse me, uh, in the investment category uh, that, will, uh, that are included in the brief, uh, the first is permitting, um, which again has already come up today. I expect will not be the last time uh, that it comes up today. And here we suggest a two-pronged approach. Uh, we recommend uh, ways to realize the full potential of, of recent legislation uh, to help facilitate vast increases in clean electricity, um, including the significant build out of the transmission that will be necessary to deliver that power. Uh, we also uh, identify steps to reduce or minimize the amount of new permitting required um, including an emphasis on brownfield development that can help to not only reduce permitting needs, but also leverage uh, existing infrastructure. The second section within uh, the investment category is focused on the IRA technology neutral tax guidance. Uh, and so, as many of you know, much of the IRA's uh, investments really are focused on tax uh, incentives. And so here we're urging the Department of the Treasury to swiftly issue guidance that defines qualified facilities in ways that are consistent with other parts of the tax code to really, again, make sure that we're driving the kind of certainty that the private sector needs to make investment at scale. The third section in investment is focused on decarbonizing transportation. Here, there have been a lot of, uh, of key policies that were included in both the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, but making sure that those are implemented in ways that will attract additional follow-on private sector investment, again, are going to be really key to, to seeing those technologies deployed at scale. Uh, also, given some of the challenges of electrification in certain use cases, it's also going to be really important to develop low-carbon fuels. Uh, and we identify several steps in the brief uh, to help support the deployment of those technologies. Uh, 
The last section in investment is focused on accelerating industrial and building efficiency and decarbonization. One of the key absences in the Inflation Reduction Act is really support for industrial efficiency and clean thermal technologies, many of which already exist today and with targeted support could be deployed at scale with significant emissions reductions as well as economic potential. The second category following on investment is focused on competitiveness. Uh, and so here, we're really focused on ensuring that the U.S. can compete in a global economy that is increasingly guided by the urgency of decarbonization. So as the impacts of climate change continue to intensify, uh, we expect that trend to accelerate, making it almost as urgent uh, to build the low-carbon economy, uh, to take these steps, rather, to build the low-carbon economy as it is to address climate change itself. So these recommendations are intended to build on America's existing uh, carbon advantage, um, meaning that goods produced here in the United States tend to have a lower emissions footprint than those produced by the global average, and in particular, many of our key trading partners. So there's a real opportunity here for us to lean into that, uh, into that advantage. It is also important that we recognize that advantage is not fixed. Uh, as other nations continue to make investments in decarbonizing their own economies, uh, it will be really important for us to continue to nurture that advantage uh, through smart targeted policy like those included in the brief. Um, so recommendations uh, in the competitiveness category fall into five sections. Uh, the first is focused on supply chain for critical minerals. Establishing and improving domestic supply chains uh, will not only be crucial for economy-wide decarbonization, but also have outsized impacts on the supply chain and, and uh, by uh, consequence, um, the long-term competitiveness of our economy. Permitting workforce capacity and investments in onshore processing uh, and manufacturing are key elements of, of this set of recommendations. The second section, and uh, you heard uh, Congresswoman Miller Meeks mention hydrogen. Uh, we have a section focused on that technology. Uh, obviously, electrification is a key decarbonization strategy, but reliance on economy wide electrification, excuse me, as a sole approach uh, is limiting, costly, and risky. Uh, and so clean hydrogen offers or can offer the potential to more effectively address uh, specific applications like industrial process heat, heavy duty and long haul transportation, shipping, aviation, et cetera. Uh, and so we offer several recommendations to support uh, that technology. The third section, just checking around, make sure everybody's still, still awake and with me here. Uh, the third section in competitiveness is focused on accelerating industrial efficiency and decarbonization. So the long-term competitiveness of manufacturers is going to be heavily influenced by the availability and adoption of low-carbon technologies. So we offer several recommendations to support retrofits and the deployment of these technologies, specifically recommendations for how to implement the Section 48C tax credit uh, that would help maximize, excuse me, maximize the benefit of this provision. Uh, the next section in competitiveness is focused on clean procurement and embodied carbon. Uh, C2S has done some work on this, uh, some broader work on this issue. And what we found is that growing domestic markets for low carbon goods is really a key way to help accelerate the commercial availability of those technologies. A key challenge to doing that has been the availability of reliable product level data on life cycle emissions. Uh, and so we've been, uh, we outline in the, the brief a few ways that we can try to tackle that problem. Uh, we also uh, rec offer recommendations to uh, to not only help reduce emissions, but leverage buy clean policies to help build out domestic supply chains that can help strengthen that, that long-term carbon advantage. The last section in competitiveness is focused on climate and trade. Uh, climate is obviously becoming an increasing focus uh, in, in international conversations, and there are several opportunities that the U.S. Uh, can take to strengthen its uh, global trading position while also reducing emissions. And so in this section, we recommend steps to increase U.S. exports of clean energy technologies, uh, establish a carbon border adjustment mechanism, and also a carbon club uh, with trading partners. The next category is focused on communities. This focus uh, is especially important as communities face unique challenges uh, in not only responding to the impacts of climate change, but also in developing strategies to capitalize on economic opportunities that are emerging in that transition. Those opportunities to be authentic really have to reflect local capacities, assets, and desires. 
So any successful approach to addressing uh, those challenges will have to focus on providing tools uh, and support to uh, those communities themselves to identify and move towards the future they want uh, for themselves. So that's really a, a focus for this uh, section of the brief, uh, which is split into four different sections. Uh, the first is minimizing harms and expanding access to benefits. The impacts of climate change, as we've discussed, uh, as well as the cost of our efforts to address it, fall disproportionately across society, often harming communities that already experience social, economic, or racial injustice. So as we think about decarbonization, it must aim to not only mitigate those burdens, uh, but be able to do so in a way that is guided by communities that we're really going to ensure an equitable transition. The second section in the communities category uh, is focused on building local capacity. So even as additional resources like those included in the infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act make those resources available, many communities uh, lack the administrative capacity to really be able to capitalize on those opportunities. And this is really acts as a significant constraint, not only to decarbonization, but also to low carbon economic development. Uh, and uh, so often, uh, we want to make sure that we are, are focusing on building that local capacity. The third section um, in communities focuses on ways to prepare the workforce for the clean energy economy. And so here, there's really a focus not only on leveraging skills of the existing workforce, but also building out and making sure that, that new uh, and younger folks who are entering the workforce are aware of uh, the opportunities that, that it will present and are able to take advantage of them. Uh, and so we highlight several approaches that can help to prepare not only the workforce, but also employers for emerging opportunities in the low carbon future. Uh, the last section in community is focused on uh, climate resilience. So as the frequency and intensity of natural disasters like wildfires, floods, droughts, and extreme weather uh, increase, the cost of these disasters for communities and businesses across the country uh, are rising. Uh, the fourth category uh, of, of recommendations is focus on economy-wide approaches, um, as well as other sectors not addressed elsewhere in the brief. Uh, and so uh, briefly, because I see that we, uh, Representative Peters is arriving here, these policies are really focused on trying to, to maximize the multiplier effect that those approaches can have uh, in helping other uh, policies be more, more effective ultimately. Um, and in this section or this category, actually, we've got a set of recommendations spanning methane, nature-based solutions, agriculture, carbon dioxide removal, and recycling. Uh, and so, uh, again, I think there's really some valuable recommendations in this uh, in this section. Uh, lastly, um, market-based policies, as I've as I've touched on briefly. Um, so the policies out outlined in this brief are intended to recognize the important progress that we've made over the last couple of years. Uh, but also to understand that there's more work to be done. Fortunately, many of these policies won't just reduce emissions. They'll also help benefit our economy by providing a foundation to accelerate private sector investment at scale, enhance our competitiveness, support communities, and ensure that decarbonization is cost-effective across the economy. C2S looks forward to working uh, with companies and other stakeholders to advance these policies through direct engagement uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. So joining us now is Congressman Scott Peters, who has served the 50th and the 52nd districts of California since 2012. Congressman Peters has been a career civic leader and public servant as an environmental lawyer and a city council member of San Diego. Representative Peters is a member of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, has been a lead sponsor of the Save Our Sequoias Act, which addresses preventative measures against wildfires, and has also been a leader on a number of other issues, climate resilience, permitting, and so on, uh, that are dear, near and dear to our hearts uh, on the climate community. Representative Peters, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks and good morning. I, I also want to start by acknowledging that, um, Ian, my uh, my brain, my um, exterior hard drive is Tom Erb, who's a former uh, C2ES employee and hard worker. And if he offers you all hope that if you want a job where you can work um, 24 seven with really limited monetary possibilities, that there's something out there for you. But um, Tom's doing great work, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, it's gonna be a really fun term, I think, in uh, climate and energy. Um, but I'd start by saying that um, the country has never solved any big problem, um, whether it's winning a world war, 
or um, sending someone to the moon or fighting back against the pandemic with one political party. It's got to be done in a bipartisan way. That's the only way that's going to be durable and effective. Um, and that's certainly true for energy security and climate um, in, in this regard. And I do know you you had uh, Representative uh, Marionette Mil Miller Meeks here before. Um, she's one we're working on to get involved in transmission uh, and hope that um, we can get her on our bill. Um, and But she's just one example of people who are open to working with other folks uh, on the other side of the committee. And she's a great addition to the Energy and Commerce Committee, the new addition. So on permitting reform, transmission, clean energy, I think we are looking for partners like her. Um, we saw your new report, Reaching for 2030, Climate and Energy Policy Priorities. Uh, you've got some really good recommendations in there um, to address climate change and enhance the competitiveness of U.S. industries. Um, and I'd love to work with you uh, on a few examples to advance a true climate and trade regime. Um, first, you know, the U.S. cannot act alone. We're going to make progress, but we represent only 10% of global emissions. Uh, so we're going to have to work with international partners to address this problem. Um, people, by the way, people on the committees on the, on the other side, my Republican colleagues, some say, well, you are only 10%. Why should we do anything? And I just address that up front. There's two reasons I think why we should do anything is one is that um, we set an example for a quality of life and standard of living that people aspire to all across the world and want to develop their own countries and economies to mimic. We do a lot by showing that we can have a very high standard of, of, uh, of living without relying just on oil and gas and fossil fuels. So we have to set that example. We have to show that we're a first world, the, the place to live, but look, look how we power ourselves. It's not the traditional way. And we have to prove that. The other thing is that um, I would like our country to be the place where innovation happens. Right? As we think about the transition that's gonna happen globally away from fossil fuels, um, how will that happen? I'd like American technology to develop that. So that's why we want to invest early on in incentives for things like carbon capture and developing industries. We want to subsidize early industries uh, as they get off the ground. And um, you know, I think that's in the national interest. But I also think um, you know, trade is another issue where uh, we've offered a border carbon adjustment idea with Senator Coons. I think that's going to be something that's coming. Um, on methane, I think we want to ensure uh, strong methane standards in the final rules, as you all recommend. Uh, we should look to reduce methane in the waste and agriculture sectors as well. Uh, landfills and wastewater facilities are, are growingly methane contributors, especially overseas, so we want to collaborate on, on solutions there. On carbon removal, we successfully um, inserted language giving the Department of Energy authority to establish carbon removal procurement program in last year's funding bill. And we, we'd like to encourage you to work with DOE to ensure that that program has high standards for monitoring, reporting, and verification and incentivizes scalable uh, technology deployment. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about permitting reform, which you may have noticed I've talked, a, you know, a, um, I picked a little bit of a, of a fight on. Um, last year, we provided significant funding to build cleaner and more secure energy through historic legislation like the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This Congress, we need to work on speed. Uh, we can have all the money in the world, but if we don't move faster, we will not succeed. So I just want to men uh, mention, um, for example, high voltage transmission, interstate transmission. According to research from Princeton University, 80% of the projected emissions reductions from the Inflation Reduction Act depend on transmission and on building transmission, more transmission, faster. Berkeley Lab found that there are currently enough solar, wind, and storage projects in the pipeline to power nearly 85% of the economy, but 80% of them could be canceled because of insufficient transmission. According to Jesse Jenkins at Princeton, the current power grid took 150 years to build. We need to build another power grid of the same size in 15 years and another one in the 15 years after that. We have to triple the size of this grid in 30 years. And that means 200,000 miles of new transmission lines by the 2030s. So how have we been doing? 200,000 is what we need and by the 2030s. Over the last decade, we've built 1,800 miles a year, 18,000 because it takes, it takes more than 10 years to complete one line. Seven of the 10 years are permitting and planning, not construction. How are other countries doing? Well, they're doing much better. 
Um, so according to Americans for Clean Energy Grid, North America has built seven gigawatts of interregional transmission, less than half of that in the United States. So let's say out of seven, less, let's say give us, give us four, say we did four in the United States. The comparable number in South America is 22. Comparable number in Europe is 44. And China, 260. You may not want to compare yourself to whatever labor practices are in China, but just take Europe, 44, we're at four. Um, what's the difference? What's the problem? Well, in the 1970s, our priority was, as environmentalists, was to stop dirty projects. We passed the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, which was designed to make sure that there was public input and that federal agencies would, would consider the environmental effects of any project that they did and, um, and the potential um, uh, alternatives before they made a decision. And we have NEPA to thank for a lot of environmental preservation, right? Um, but its implementation is inevitably slow. Documents have come to be thousands of pages long. Reviews take years, four years to complete. And NEPA is now the most litigated environmental statute. Um, lawsuits can drag out for more than a decade. And the simple threat of litigation can prevent new projects, including the climate action projects that we need from going forward at all. So we're in this position where to save the planet, we have to build a lot of stuff. We have to build transmission. We have to build utility scale solar, passenger rail, hydrogen pipelines, direct air carbon capture uh, at the local level, bike lanes, more infill housing. And the irony is that many of the laws intended 50 years ago to protect the environment may be what undermine us from protecting the environment today. Now, some claim that NEPA and other environmental laws aren't the problem or that they can't be touched, but I don't think that that's, that approach is really compatible with the science or the time we have left to maintain a stable climate. There will be some inevitable trade-offs, but the risks of maintaining the status quo in the face of a warming planet are too great. Um, and fixing laws, uh, to serve the public good is actually my job. It's what we're supposed to do when we're sent here. Uh, and I believe we can achieve in high environmental standards in less time and that we have to. NEPA was signed into law in 1970, okay? 165 of my congressional colleagues were not yet born. We are as far today from 1970 as 1970 was from 1917. This is a really old law. Um, and we're, char we're charged to update it for our times and it's okay, it's not sacred text. It didn't come from Moses, right? It came from people like us. They just didn't have word processors. They had IBM Selectric uh, typewriters, which you probably don't even remember those things, but um, but it wasn't magic. It was just lawmaking and that's what we have to do. We have to, we have to take on the challenge of adapting those laws for today's challenges. And excessive process is not the only challenge for climate change, but it is one. And those of us who are committed to climate actions who say, that climate is the greatest challenge we face, uh, we're, we're really called to rethink these processes which can become cumbersome and that are decelerating the development of clean energy. We have to dramatically reform our processes without undermining environmental progress, and I think we can do that. So for example, we can determine non-sensitive landscapes and provide streamlined permitting or even automatic approvals for clean energy projects on those lands. Uh, that idea tracks with your recommendation to establish, C2ES's recommendation to establish renewable energy zones where many clean projects can be developed and connected to high voltage transmission. We can expand programmatic reviews for clean energy, especially offshore wind, to do permitting on a more regional rather than a project by project, project by project basis. We can give clean energy projects like interstate transmission and geothermal projects the same favorable permitting as oil and gas. But as someone who's practiced law in this field, I don't believe we can sustain project by project litigation and achieve climate action with the money and the time we have, even all that money that we have. Um, and we, you know, maybe we, we're doing um, more litigation and more uh, analysis at a program level, but then project by project, we, we build these things out without having so much litigation. We have to find a way to advance reforms or we're gonna risk having a few financial interests block climate progress for the many, and we're gonna need your help. Um, the report, you, this C2S, C2ES's report provides additional recommendations that are helpful, like reviewing new categorical exclusions, especially for clean energy and proposing bonus credits for brownfields energy infrastructure. 
Um, please keep sharing those ideas with us, um, how we can speed up the process in general, um, whether it's reforms to NEPA or any other laws that, that make, can, can make the process make more sense, still achieve high environmental standards, but with much less time expended and much less drag. Uh, and maybe those are for specific technologies like carbon capture, offshore wind, utility scale solar. Um, and I, I, I congratulate you too for engaging both Republicans and Democrats in this um, because uh, it really is going to be something that we all have to do together. Uh, Democrats are going to have to accept, and this makes people very nervous, uh, that environmental laws written in the 1970s primarily to stop things from happening or slow things down can be updated to meet the environmental challenges of today, which mean building things. Um, and I really want to look forward to working with you to make permitting reform a reality. Republicans have begun to, as you've heard from Marionette, accept that climate change is, is real and it's driven by human activity. And that's a profound move. Um, they're going to have to step up and actually legislate around that as well. So thanks to Nathan, to Nate, to, to Jason and C2ES for the invitation. I'm happy to answer any questions um, and uh, really look forward to working with you in, the, in this term. I think it's going to be a really productive one. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Congressman Peters. Um, let me ask you very quickly, and then we've got uh, Pedro Pizarro from, from uh, uh, Edison International coming up uh, live from California. But oh, wow. let me ask you really quickly, you mentioned so much uh, so much of what's in our role, uh, in our recommendations, and you focused on permitting. Where do you see the bipartisan potential right away? I mean, where is that something that happens this year, and how can we come in and, and help? Uh, so... Um... I would keep your eye on the Natural Resources Committee and Bruce Westerman, who's a friend of mine. Bruce is a very unassuming, humble guy from Arkansas, but he also has a graduate degree from the Yale School of Forestry. He knows more about forestry than anyone in Congress. He's uh, helped us develop the Save Our Sequoias Bill, which provides money and process reform to make sure that we save those groves. Um, but that, that larger work will have to apply to wildfires, which have now become a bigger contributor to to, to um, climate pollution than the whole power sector in California, for instance. And I think that the, there's an opportunity there. They're, the Republicans like like uh, Bruce and like John Curtis are very conscious that they have to be pro-environment, that they, they, they will be, that the Republicans will be suspected of wanting to strip away environmental protection. But I think, you know, there's people in the leadership who understand, no, we have to figure out a way to achieve these objectives, less drag. And I think we all have an interest in that. So I think that's, that's really a possibility this time. Well, thanks so much, Congressman, for joining us. I know thanks you need to get back to the Good luck Thank to you all. You. Appreciate it. Terrific. So we are now really pleased to have our next speaker. I'll be very quick because he's joining us from California. Uh, Pedro, thanks so much for joining us. I know you have a short uh, bit of time. Joining us, Dr. Pedro Pizarro, President and CDO, CEO of Edison International, who will share more on what he's seeing uh, in the power sector. Pedro was president of SCE from 2014 to 2016, uh, and he's, a, he's before he became pres, uh, president and CEO of Edison International uh, and is a member of the board of directors of Edison International and Southern California Edison. He, earns a PhD, he holds a PhD in chemistry from Caltech and held National Science Foundation and Department of Defense graduate fellowships. Pedro, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Hey, Nat, thanks so much for having me here today and congratulations on the great report. I think we have a lot of alignment uh, across the areas in it. Uh, it is always good to join C2ES to discuss the clean energy future. Uh, at Edison International, just for folks who may not know us, we have our utility subsidiary, Southern California Edison, uh, and an energy advisory subsidiary, Edison Energy, and we're helping the power sector lead the transition to a clean energy future and economy-wide electrification. Uh, SCE serves 15 million residents throughout Southern California. Edison Energy is serving about a quarter of the Fortune 100. And so today, while a lot of our focus is on keeping the power flowing for our customers safely, uh, our strategy, strategy is really focused on leading the clean energy transition and, and fighting climate change. I think this is true for our sector as a whole, and, and the U.S. power sector has made a lot of progress reducing GHG emissions. Uh, our car carbon emissions are, are their lowest levels in nearly 40 years. Uh, the emissions from the sector are as low as they were in 1984, uh, while electricity use has gone up 72% in the same time frame. More than half of the new electricity generation capacity added over the past decade was wind and solar. And just in 2021, we saw nearly 27 gigawatts of renewable uh, energy go online in the US. That's enough to power about 20 million homes. 
So that's really important because as you know, renewables are an essential element of this transition. Uh, in our home state of California, reaching these climate goals is going to require a near complete transformation of how the state sources and uses energy across the economy. And same applies nationally and, and globally. Uh, you know, we think that the pathway there is high levels of electrification coupled with clean power to fuel that, as well as low carbon fuels for hard to electrify end uses. And so if you fast forward to 2045, we see the state having three quarters of its vehicles and 90% of its buildings be electric. Uh, that's a, going to lead to a 60% increase in demand, a 40% increase in peak load. But importantly, uh, we're going to see technologies like electric vehicles, rooftop solar, battery storage. That's going to be great for this, you know, in terms of decarbonization, but it does mean that electricity demand is going to be more variable and hard to predict. And so uh, at the same time, our customers are going to be expecting even greater reliability and resilience since more of their lives will be powered by electricity. And the ability to have two-way power flow so that customers can both be taking power from the grid and supplying it to it. So this is going to require advancements in grid planning and in operations. Uh, for example, being able to predict and plan for large variable loads that come when a commercial or an industrial customer decides to go all electric. It's going to require a lot of investment. And, and just in our, in our state, we estimate that we'll need something like $250 billion between now and 2045 to access renewables, storage, and to modernize the grid. And that's where it was so great to hear uh, both uh, uh, representatives, Miller Meeks and Peters, talk about the need for permit reform and the need to build quickly. And we, we agree with that. Uh, so that investment, though, is going to be worth it. And the key here is that for the end use customer, when you add it all up and look at all that investment, if you look at their total bill across all forms of energy, electric plus natural gas plus gasoline, that average customer in our state is going to be spending one third less in real terms in 2045 than they do today. And that's because electric technologies like electric motors are so much more efficient than burning fuel in a combustion engine. So that's a real economic value to be captured from all this investment. Uh, the federal government is going to be a key partner in this. We're really encouraged by the sense of urgency in Washington. Uh, the IIJA, the IRA are already putting capital to work across the country. But uh, success is not guaranteed. And there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, Edison International released a paper in late 2021 called Mind the Gap. And there, focusing again on California, we saw that the state uh, had done a good job reducing emissions 1% uh, a year over the last uh, uh, couple of decades, but needs to actually quadruple that to a 4% rate if it's going to make its interim 2030 goal. That's a big jump in just the next seven years. So to close that gap, we found the need for a lot of the types of policies that the C2ES paper outlined and is highlighting today. And one thing that I want to touch on in particular, uh, again, is the importance of siting and permitting reform. Uh, transmission is going to play a really key role in enabling this clean energy transformation uh, and in keeping the national energy supply resilient, reliable, and affordable. Uh, there was a Harvard review of 30 transmission projects that were initiated after the Energy Policy Act of 2005. And it found that projects can take more than 10 years on average to complete. Uh, to, uh, Representative Peter's point, it's just way too long. We need to be building faster. And I know that our country can do better than this. We need to improve policies and processes to evaluate and promote the development of cost-effective inter-regional and multi-regional transmission facilities. And the right reforms are going to help ensure that investments can flow into the economy while managing cost risks for our customers. Really encouraging that IIJA included nearly $5 billion to support transmission development and new authorities that enabled the federal government to intervene in state level siting disputes. Uh, last year, the White House outlined a strategy for helping to accelerate the deployment of critical energy infrastructure. And we commend the administration for recognizing that building new transmission is essential to achieving these goals and to enhancing grid resilience. These are all good steps. And we look forward to continued progress in this area, as well as the bipartisan support that we've continued to see for these efforts. So I just want to close that by saying thanks to you, to the great team at C2EES, and to all the stakeholders there in the room. Wish I could be with you. It's probably warmer in DC than it is in California right now. Uh, but all of you for broadly supporting this important work. 
uh, we all know that the cost to invest in climate strategies is a lot lower than the cost of an action. And we've seen this firsthand in California with the devastating effects of climate change. We've had eight of the largest wildfires in state history just in the last six years. So work is important, especially for the many folks across our entire country who are most impacted by climate change or are most vulnerable to it. Uh, in 2021, 40% of Americans lived in counties that were impacted by a climate-related disaster. And last year was the eighth consecutive year in which 10 or more billion dollar weather and climate disaster events affected the US. So we can't wait any longer. It's an important time for all of us to lean in and collaborate, make the investments needed, make a difference for future generation, generations and for the planet. And Nat, I'm really glad that you're leading C2ES as a key enabler of all of that. Well, Pedro, thank you so much for those kind words and for that terrific presentation and, and the discussion of what Edison is doing. Um, just to give you a picture of the scene, um, we've got you up on the screen and right behind you is a great view of the US Capitol. So everything you're talking about in terms and that we're talking about in terms of the policies we need uh, is uh, is right on point with what we're looking at. Um, if I can ask you one quick question, I know you've got really, uh, you've, you've got a busy schedule already, even though it's uh, only 7.30 out there in the in the West Coast. Um, you talked about affordability and the cost and, and how important I know that is to, uh, to Edison. One portion of our policy work, as you know, is on uh, workforce development and clean energy. So thinking about the labor side, and I know that's something you've thought a lot about. Can you say anything, a couple of things about workforce development from an Edison perspective and, and what we should have in mind as we think about that transition? Absolutely. And I like how you couple the question with affordability because that's the basis for our communities, right? So, you know, we, a third of our residential customers qualify for low-income assistance. So this is real and creating jobs is uh, critical in, as part of the transition. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we have a diverse and inclusive workforce. Uh, in 2021, there were already more than half a million California workers employed in clean energy jobs. And we see a lot of growth coming in this area, but we want to make sure that that growth is one that's bringing all communities along and delivering the clean energy future with economic benefits to every one of our local communities. We can't leave any group behind. And so as a company, we've prioritized giving uh, charitably in education, especially in the STEM fields, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, math. I'm, as you know, I'm, you mentioned I, I'm, a, I'm a scientist at heart here. And so the workforce development programs that we've been creating help provide job opportunities and education to prepare folks to go into the clean energy future. A couple of examples of things we're doing, uh, my favorite program in the company is a program that provides $50,000 scholarships to 30 uh, uh, high school graduating seniors each year in our territory. Uh, we have another program where we've committed a million dollars to develop a line worker scholarship program that's helping bring in uh, individuals from uh, uh, underrepresented backgrounds. Started out with Black and African American uh, candidates. We're expanding this now to other groups uh, to help them populate the line worker trade, which is one where it takes seven years to create a line worker. Uh, it's a real apprenticeship, and that's a critical job for the clean energy future, and we need more of those folks. So whether it's line workers, whether it's solar installers, whether it's folks maintaining wind turbines, uh, you know, technicians for batteries, for electric vehicles, there's a big job opportunity there ahead. It's going to help transition folks who are in industries that, or sectors that will see some decline over time, like fossil fuels. And I think we can create the brilliant uh, economic future together for all of our communities. Well, thanks so much, Pedro, for that. And thanks so much for, again for joining us from California. You've uh, Edison International has been such a great partner for C2AS, and, and I've, we've really appreciated working with you in particular and your team. So thanks so much for joining us um, and really appreciate your, uh, your taking the time to help us as we launch these policy recommendations. Thanks much, Nan. It was great seeing you in Sharm El Sheikh. And if I don't see you before, then see you in Dubai. Absolutely. <laughs> thanks, Pedro. Take care. So now for the last part of our program, we've got a terrific lineup uh, panel of, uh, of, of corporate executive speakers. Um, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Verena Radulovic, C2S's Vice President for Business Engagement to moderate that discussion. Verena? I think I have two mics going. So do I need this one? No? Okay. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as Nat mentioned, am I on? Yeah, okay. I'm Verena Radulovic. I'm our Vice President for Business Engagement. And he talked about our business council at the start of the event. These are 42 companies that are committed to climate action and are working with us to advance climate policy. 
They represent a diverse number of sectors, and these are companies that are challenged with finding ways to reduce their emissions, often because their operations have hard to abate emissions. I'd like to invite up our three speakers to join me up here. First, we have Michael Amans, who is from Wholesome USA. He's a vice president in ESG and chief sustainability officer at Wholesome. Wholesome is one of the largest companies, uh, cement companies globally. We also have Jane Park, who's our senior vice president of federal affairs and public policy at Exelon. Exelon serves 10 million customers across different states. And so we're going to talk about energy. And Andre is the director, Andre Welch is the director of federal affairs at Ford Motor Company. And as many of you know, Ford is one of our most iconic US companies and a global force when it comes to automobiles. We're going to hear from our guests about why climate policy is top of mind for their companies. And before we go ahead and get started, I feel myself going in and out. Am I, can you hear me? Okay, we're good. All right, great. So Michael, we're going to start with you. And what I'd love to, uh, to hear from first is tell us about Wholesome's climate goals. And then I'd love to hear about why, pick two or three poli climate policies and why they are so important to Wholesome. Thanks, Rena. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this, this is actually my second time joining C2ES for the, uh, for the policy uh, uh, launch. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and really what, uh, what's happened since I did it, I guess, four or five years ago, is a tremendous amount of action uh, across, the, across the U.S., across the globe. Uh, for, for Wholesome, uh, we've made a commitment to be net zero by 2050. Uh, we have a very aggressive climate reduction targets that are validated by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And for, for me as a member of the U.S. leadership team, I'm responsible for helping execute against those strategy goals uh, at the U.S. level for, for the company. Uh, for, for us, um, I'm going to focus on three quick uh, priorities. These are embedded into the C2ES report. Uh, the first one is... In, in, in the context of, of, uh, of climate policy, we support, uh, Wholesome supports a economy-wide market-based market price on carbon. <clears throat> We've supported that policy through changes of administration, changes in control of Congress. It is by far the quickest and easiest way to decarbonize the U.S. Um, and I know in the context of the, the makeup of Congress, this, this go-round, it's a very unlikely policy objective, but it's something that we've advocated for for over a decade. We will continue to advocate for it. And there's a hope uh, that that uh, future Congress will take action and put in place an economy-wide price on carbon. And why do I say that's a priority for us? Because we have concerns as a coast-to-coast -coast operator in the US about a patchwork of cap and invest or cap and trade policies uh, popping up in different states. And we could have policies in New York and California that are different than what we have in Iowa. And it's it's really concerning as we look at the whole U.S. business and, and our investment strategy for the U.S. <clears throat> um, a second priority for, for Wholesome is carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Uh, for an energy-intensive trade-exposed business like cement, uh, it is the future that we have uh, for the company is, is really embedded in CCUS. I was on a uh, on a webinar this morning with our chairman of the board, and we're starting a, a race across the globe. We have 50 CCUS projects around the world, three in the U.S., uh, and we're looking to see who can invest in the technology, have it uh, at uh, full scale, commercial scale uh, uh, CCUS project, and have the first decarbonized cement plant in the world. And I think really what, with the passage of the legislation last year, the U.S. has repositioned itself where we have three projects. We have 13 cement plants in the U.S. We produce about one in five tons of cement that's produced domestically. <clears throat> and we have three projects that if they were all to move forward, they could be in place prior to 2030. So these are, these are really exciting changes that are, have been enabled by the passage of the legislation. And the last one is procurement. Procurement, procurement, procurement. Uh, really, if you look at uh, cement, concrete, asphalt, aggregates, uh, our roofing business, most decisions made by government are based solely on price. <clears throat> so there's no accounting for the carbon content or the global warming potential of, of products. And the Biden-Harris administration has moved the ball 
considerably in the last year and a half, uh, really taking a look at how do you use the power of the purse that the federal government has and all of the ways that the funds flow from the federal government to states, to counties, to cities, <clears throat> Uh, to, to ensure that buy clean policies are put in place uh, for federal procurement. So there's a there's a lot that's been started. There's a lot of, of, uh, of work that needs to be done in that space, but it's something that really excites uh, so excites our company as we look to decarbonize our cement production and decarbonize uh, concrete uh, that we we have a lot we have a lot of uh, area to gain if the government falls through on the actions that that they started at the beginning of this term of the administration. Jen. Thank you, Michael. We'll come back to that and, and go into some more detail there. When we think about a company like Wholesome that is responsible for making much of the infrastructure that we have in our country, from our roads to our bridges to the infrastructure that makes up our electric utilities, I'd like to uh, move now to Jane to talk about Exelon. Same question. Tell us a little bit about Exelon's goal and why climate policy is important, picking out a few of the, of the policies that are top of mind for Exelon. Yeah, I appreciate it, Verena. Um, well, first of all, let me thank you and Nat and C2ES for convening everybody. I thought it was a really interesting discussion this morning and for inviting me to be on the panel. I want to spend one minute, though, because I've learned the hard way. Never assume that everybody knows what you do. I have... Uh, Many family and friends who have even decades later still think I work for the gas company that they pump their gas on. And I have to say, mom, <laughs> mom, I work for an energy company and we have the largest amount of uh, one of the largest transmission and distribution energy companies in America. You heard 10 million customers, but I like to focus on the fact that we're in some of the most populous and diverse cities in America. Chicago, Philly, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., where we're from, and we have six utilities in seven jurisdictions. I explained that in slightly different words to her, but, you know, one day, one day she'll finally remember. Um, so what do we care about as Exelon, right? I mean, at the end of the day, our mission is very simple. It is all very customer centered. You know, our customers want to be connected to clean affordable, resilient, safe power. And I think the thing that is really important for us, and I'm sure you all know it, is it's not clean or, it's clean and secure and resilient and affordable and equitable. And for us, it's just a truism. There's no substitutability in that for our customers. It's not like they're willing to trade off one for the other. So in terms of our priorities, when we think climate wise, First, I wanna just also talk about like one of our priorities in the terms of mitigation is to reduce our own carbon footprint. Kind of like how you heard Michael mention for Wholesome. We have a path to clean commitment. We are gonna be net zero by 2050. We've already cut off about maybe 250,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. So we're well on our way to that pathway. I think by my lawyer math, that's like 7 million trees. Um, in addition to that though, we're also trying to help our customers support their commitment. You've heard us talk about energy efficiency across our portfolio. We have probably helped our customers reduce their usage by 22 million megawatt hours. So that's pretty significant. But moving past that, another policy priority, climate policy priority for us in terms of decarbonization and reducing um, emissions is transportation electrification. That is without question one of the largest policy goals we're focused on and anything that supports that. Just so you can size it for us, when I take a look at all the states in which Exelon serves, our states almost cumulatively have said they want like 4.3 million EVs on the road between 2025 and 2045. I'm not even gonna to begin to tell you how many EVs we have on the road today. That's a pretty sizable task that we have to get up there. So we have been working on a number of tactics to support that policy solution, right? Everything from working within the regulatory and, the, and our states and at the federal level for incentives, rebates, credits, rate designs, EV rates, et cetera to actually really focusing on equity. We haven't talked as much about it here. I've heard it mentioned a little bit about the disproportionate impact that climate change has on our communities. That is very front and center for us, this question of environmental justice and impact. So as we try to do pilots, as we try to put down our EVs, we're looking, where are we gonna put our multimodal fam charging hubs? Are they gonna be in low-income areas? Are we gonna do ride shares? And are we gonna start first with low-income communities? 
we have signed on to the EPA school bus pledge as part of the EPA clean school bus grant money that came out. That's important to us, right? Because it's not just the urban communities, it's also the rural communities. And you can get money for clean school buses, but it's a real equity question as to whether school districts, particularly in some of our most under-resourced communities, can use them. And so when we think about priorities, that's the top one. And the final one, actually, I was, I was going to say, I mean, first of all, I want to talk about transmission at some point today, but it feels like everybody's talked about transmission this morning. <laughs> I feel like saying ditto might actually be efficient. Maybe let me pull up a little bit and we can get into it certainly a little bit more today. But um, I would say in addition to that, there is a question of continually reinvesting in the modernization and strengthening of the grid. And I know that sounds like 1980s, 2020s, it's never been more critical. We have to continue investing more in security and cyber. And frankly, just like Michael, you were saying, we don't have all the technologies we need. We have a lot of technologies, but we're doing a significant amount of R&D. I think this group probably also knows we need more climate impact technologies. Exelon invests about $20 million mm. over 20 years in our climate change investment initiative, which is 2C2I. That's to bring startup technologies to the table. So I will pause there and hand it over to Andre, <laughs> who wants to speak, I'm sure. But this is an area in which I'm passionate about. And we have a lot of reasons why climate change is important to us. I mean, it is our business model. It's not something else. It is our bread and butter business. Excellent. Well, before I turn to Andre, who here owns an electric vehicle? Who here um, plans to buy one in the next two years? For sure. Okay, so I'd like to turn to Andre to talk about Ford's priorities. As many of you know, Ford split into two companies, one that continues to make ICEs and one that is making electric vehicles. So tell us a little bit about Ford's goals and what are the two or three policy priorities that Ford cares the most about? Yeah, um, thanks, Farina. Thanks uh, to my fellow panelists. Uh, one of the benefits of being the last to speak is you can um, kind of echo some of what's been said, because uh, I, I fully agree. I'm excited um, by this conversation. So thank you for inviting me. I'm excited um, by this conversation because several of the priorities that you see in the, in the 2030 priority document, you heard from the speakers here, um, there's a, a chorus that is building, uh, and that gives me a lot of excitement. Um, I'm here representing Ford Motor Company, very excited about the developments. Um, uh, that we're making as a company. This is a really exciting time to be part of the automotive industry. Um, Ford is committed to, to doing its part to, uh, to address climate change. We have very aggressive goals. Um, we want to be carbon neutral by 2050. You've heard that um, from a few members here. Um, a big part of that is addressing the transportation electrification. So um, we have an aspiration to have 600,000 electric vehicles um, on the road by the end of this year. Um, we want the capability to produce 2 million by the end of 26. And we want 50% of our vehicles to be all electric by 2030. So there's a lot of runway from where we are today to where we have to get to. Um, and so that will drive some of the priorities that uh, we point out. But we're putting uh, action behind our ambition. Um, so we are investing $50 billion uh, between now and 2026 to support electrification. Um, some of that is uh, investing in our most iconic vehicles. So um, Ford is making a big bet on electrification. We are um, electrifying our most iconic vehicles, vehicles that um, we know the customer well, they're high volume, very popular. So the Mustang, we've electrified the Mustang mm -hmm. e the F-150, the leading uh, selling vehicle for 45 years. We have, we've electrified with the F-150 Lightning um, and uh, our transit uh, leading commercial vehicle for over 40 years. We've electrified. So these are, um, they've been very well received. We've got uh, more demand and interest than we have supply. And that's part of uh, what needs to be addressed. Um, and the and, and we're investing uh, in a domestic uh, supply chain. Uh, we have announced that uh, we're building battery plants uh, in 
um, and assembly plants in Tennessee and Kentucky, $11 billion investment, 11,000 jobs. We're also investing in a battery plant in Michigan, $3.5 billion, 2,500 jobs. So again, we're seeing that this transition to electrification is um, good for the environment, good for climate, yes, but also good for American jobs and American workers. Um, and in terms of the policies that we support, um, IJA and IRA, hugely significant uh, laws that were introduced. Um, the, the amount of funding and the opportunity that we have in the next few years um, are immense, um, but there's more to do, and you've heard some of that. And I think part of that more to do is building a domestic supply chain. And specifically, I mean, um, you know, we've dealt with coming out of COVID and having this chip crisis where we've had, again, demand for vehicles uh, that we weren't able to deploy. It quite honestly delaying the adoption of electrification. Again, when we introduced our F-150 Lightning, we had 200,000 reservations for the vehicle and we couldn't make a quarter of that due to shortage of supply. So the interest is there, the demand is there. We've got to address the supply chain shortage. Um, and so um, uh, addressing uh, my uh, uh, permit reform as it relates to critical minerals, um, you've heard that a, a couple of times, is gonna be uh, critically important. Ford has secured the minerals to, to meet its 2023 20, uh, goals, and we're well on the way to securing the minerals to meet our 2 million uh, vehicle per year aspiration in 26. But as we think about 50% by 2030, at an annual run rate for the U.S. of roughly 17 million vehicles, eight and a half million vehicles, that's a lot of critical minerals that, that amongst industry, we're going to need to find. And right now, not enough of that is in the U.S. And knowing that to move from extraction or from uh, identification to extraction is roughly 20 years, mm -hmm. we've got to move much faster if we're going to meet the goals that we've got laid out. Um, so that's a critical piece. Now, something that we haven't talked about, again, on the supply chain side is recycling. I think we definitely have to uh, leverage more of the minerals that we have here in the U.S. But the question is, once we have them here, how do we keep them here? So we need to build out that infrastructure. We need to build um, better techniques uh, to do that recycling so that once we get the critical minerals, that we may make sure that we keep them here and, and use them um, appropriately. And then uh, another piece that was touched on um, earlier is the labor side. Um, so as we think about the recycling that we want to do, uh, the, the work in uh, battery assembly, the research that we do on different chemistries for batteries, we need to build out a workforce um, that addresses that. So um, developing better coordination, better training, and, and just encouraging um, that migration into those, those kind of stemmed uh, areas um, are critical priorities for us. Farina? Can I just mention that Andre did promise me yes. in advance of this. <laughs> yeah. I'll make a couple of calls and get me in an F-150 Lightning Okay, in this color. Great. So. <laughs> can I, I just want it recorded <laughs> and verified. <laughs> has anyone has anyone driven in an F-150 Lightning? You can't buy an auto show. What about the, the, <laughs> the Mach-E? So fun. Okay. Um, so yes, excellent. Well, why don't um, I, I want to pull back and kind of come back to Michael and then we'll, we'll go through another round again. And really focus this next group of questions on what was about either the IIJA, which is the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, or the CHIPS Act. You can pick any, any or all of those three. What was in there that really helped Wholesome? You mentioned it, um, that it was catalytic in, in terms of some of the work the Biden-Harris uh, administration is doing on procurement. But what was it that kind of gave, uh, gave your company the ability to move forward? And then what what specifically needs to, to either go well or what else do we need? So you can pick any of the three that you touched on or all of them, but that's, if you can give us more of a flavor of that. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and what, what I would say, if you look at the infrastructure bill or the Inflation Reduction Act, it provides certainty for investing. <clears throat> and what, what that's done for us is if, if you look at uh, some of the actions that we're taking in, in the U.S., uh, we we announced last year that 
by the end of 2023, we will, across our coast-to-coast -coast footprint, we'll, we'll operate on 40% renewable energy from wind and solar. <clears throat> and that investment is occurring because the utilities are able to make the investment. And then we're able through virtual power purchase agreements to purchase the green energy. Uh, we, we have a target to be at 100% by, by 2030. <clears throat> It also allows us to continue to do the behind the meter investment. So we have a wind farm in Ohio. We have a solar farm in, in Maryland. We're gonna be announcing uh, additional behind the meter uh, investments in, in uh, green energy generation. And it really has created the pathway for that type of investment by a company like ours, which looks at our assets over a 50, 60 year life cycle. So we're able to make some very strategic investments based on the certainty that exists with a multi-year infrastructure bill, with a multi-year the multi-year goals in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, it also you know what what also excites me is the Department of Energy has been given a game-changing amount of money by Congress to be able to de-risk technologies, uh, to be able to really create first-of-its-kind investments in in green infrastructure in our sector, as well as to be able to, to uh, work and, and really put in place what, what I would consider the future technologies for the US that if, if they're done right and, and uh, DOE does it in a agile and quick way, also have the capacity to have the US be the leader in, the, in that space uh, globally and help to drive technology investment across the globe. So, so a lot of a lot of things embedded in the uh, in the, both of the pieces of legislation that have a massive impact and and will have a massive impact for years to come. And in terms of what's next, yeah, what's next? I think uh, you know I think there's a there's a ton of what's next. I I think you know the uh, in the legislation there was the first funding ever for environmental product declarations which are like a nutrition label for things like cement and concrete and roofing and asphalt. Um, I can tell you right now, we produce them at all of our facilities, but we probably have one in a thousand customers that ask for them and use it in decision-making. So this, the level of the level of capacity to make decisions on what you're buying, whether it's good for the environment, it, it doesn't have to be just about climate because you can look at water usage, you can look at energy usage in the materials, you can look at certainly the global warming potential. There's a lot of data that's going to be made available to the consumer to buy better, to buy cleaner, and to make really sound decisions on, on what they're procuring. Thank you. Before I turn to Jane, I think what's important to note is the interconnectedness of these sectors. They're all dependent on one another. So as we think about the, the different nodes of the economy working, Andrea, I was cognizant of what you were sharing, that they're that they they all need to be happening at the same time. So Jane, to, uh, to that point, as we look at the priorities for Exelon in terms of um, equitable access to clean energy and electrification of transportation, when you think back to any of these three pieces of legislation, what were what where, where were there um, in these legislative efforts? Why were they so important in, in advancing Exelon's goals going forward? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. And first, let me say that from Exelon's perspective, we we view this as once in a generation bipartisan funding and it's a huge opportunity and our goal is really simple we're going to bring we're going to try to bring every federal dollar that's available back to our communities it's a very simple goal because of what i said before you've heard it all throughout this morning we just can't move fast enough and even with all the investment we're doing we we can always benefit from accelerating it further we have found that this provides us with tremendous opportunities in the power sector. So for example, um, we were talking about decarbonization. Exelon is participating in the hydrogen hubs, those regional hubs, which are a great way for companies like probably Wholesome and Exelon to be able to try out these increasingly decarbonized solutions on clean fuels, potentially. And we are part of three clean hydrogen hubs that are in the running right now with um, DOE being reviewed. We have significant applications that we are finalizing, about 11 that we're putting in across our portfolio to basically bring resiliency and enable to integrate more DER into our grids. We have worked with our states in trying to make sure that the EV money, whether that's through NEVI or the clean school bus programs arrive where they need to be. 
we've put in applications for the middle mile broadband actually, because even though they don't specifically talk about decarbonization, they go to um, bridging the communicate the digital divide. I think that I don't know whether we'll win or not. I can only continue to pray at the altar and, and we'll see. <laughs> but when you look at all the things that we're trying to get, we're actually in pursuit of close to $2 billion of federal money, directly or indirectly, we're trying to bring to our communities. And if we're successful, this work could bring 8,000 jobs. I'm talking about 8,000 jobs working on all of these projects if we were to win for example, we have worked to try to bring these benefits to 40 disadvantaged communities across our portfolio, worked with 24 different universities and educational institutions, 30 different com community partners and growing. Why am I saying that? Not because I'm counting my chickens before they hatch. If you know me, you will know that like my chickens need to be in college. They need to be in a marriage reception line before I even remotely count you. I am not that kind of a person, but it's my way to say, like we're taking it very seriously. And even though it sounds perverse to encourage competition, we encourage everyone to take it very seriously because successfully implementing the federal funding that is available under IIJA is a clear priority for us. And the final thing I'll say about why I love the IIJA as the bipartisan effort that it was, it's changing the way we do it. The Justice 40 requirements in the IIJA, the specific significant weighting of those grading factors, the fact that you even have the administration now saying to the agencies, I want you to have metrics and hold yourself accountable for how much of these goods you're bringing to under-resourced communities. I'm not saying that it has game changed the way we work. Many of our utilities, not only Exelon, but many in our sector have always worked closely with their communities, but it is fueling it. And I think it is gonna change the way we work in the future on these types of federal grants. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's a great way to decarbonize the grid personally. And Jane, as you think about the next sort of 18 to 24 months, in addition to the implementation of the IIJ, yeah. if, you could if you could pick one policy that you'd like to see move forward that maybe isn't included in the, in the previous legislation or what would, you, what would you pick? Well, that's a great, Great question, because there was a significant amount that was included in there. I think there, there are two things, and I'm not sure if I would include it in, in those specifically. One thing that we are watching for is, I said everybody's focused on implementation. We're very focused on unintended consequences in the implementation. It's one thing to pass the law, but you can see from all the activity out at Treasury, out at the agencies, the guidelines, the standards, and the, and the tax rulings and guidance that'll come out will be significant on how fast or slow people at entities in our sector will be able to deliver on this promise. But more broadly to your point, and I think we heard it this morning, and this is a great opportunity to mention it, right? I mean, I think it's kind of that next evolution of what Congress has done here and the administration has done here. And okay, now as you implement it, what are things that are potentially standing in your way? And there's no question that a, a significant amount of investment in transmission is needed. Not only that's the only way you're gonna make the federal state and our customer goals for their renewable targets, at least in our jurisdictions, for example, and nationally, but frankly, let's not forget that you need this transmission investment for congestion relief because of outdated equipment material condition, because of customer requests, because of just in resiliency concerns. Mm -hmm. So that type of speed and volume is something that current processes are a bit outdated in handling. And you see some entities like PJM, when we hear and we read about in the paper about the interconnection queue and the huge backlog, and we have people, entities working on it. PGM has a, sec a session of interconnection queue reforms recently passed by FERC at the end of last year, which are gonna be very promising, but it's more along those lines of speeding up permitting and siting and making sure that we're building in, we're always so focused on building in incentives for competition Sometimes it's worth building in incentives for collaboration. And I think that is kind of the next set of things that I've heard from this morning and listening to the different congressional leaders and from Pedro and others, which is it only works if it, it, it's better if we can get more brilliant minds to work together on a common cause. And I would certainly agree with that. Great. Thank you, Jane.
So moving to Andre before I open the floor up for questions. Um, Andre, you mentioned earlier the different policy priority areas for Ford and also where broadly um, the different legislations touched on those, whether it's workforce development, critical minerals. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Where does the implementation need to go um, so that you are able to have we are able to have these intended outcomes? And and what I find really interesting about where Ford is is that you're you're dealing with the ecosystem itself, not the car. <laughs> so maybe tell us a little bit more about the the policies that were working well for Ford with regard to your policy priorities in IRA, IJA, and what needs to happen in the next two years. Yeah, sure. Um, and I'll start with just an acknowledgement of where I think we are and like the technology adoption curve. I think we're at a place where um, we're maybe in the early adopters, but quickly approaching that lower majority, that early majority that's you know really ready to take on these electric vehicles. Now, to me, that means that where an early adopter may be willing to accept a less than ideal charging experience mm -hmm. or accept some compromise, we have to get beyond that if we're going to get to the levels of adoption that we have to get to. And I think um, Ija and Ira did a great job at addressing some of that or has the potential um, to address some of that. So um, from the Ija perspective, I think of um, the uh, National EV Infrastructure Program, the money set aside for EV chargers along all fuel corridors. Um, that's money that goes to states. Um, they need to implement it. I think it's critically important that we focus on implementation. So that's done in a timely and effective way that um, has has a multiplier effect amongst the different states. Because um, I think it's going to going to be important if we're going to get that adoption that we address range anxiety. Mm. So the vehicles that are out now, I mean, you you rarely see one with less than 250 mile range. That's more than you know, than most commuters will need. Um, for their daily commute um, or a long drive, but range anxiety is still a concern. And so we need to have that infrastructure set up along interstates um, so you can have that comfort. Um, so IJA does a, a great job of that. But also we know affordability is a concern, access is a concern. Um, and so when you look at um, the Inflation Reduction Act, and some of the tax credits that they provide in there for the purchase of new vehicles, the purchase of um, uh, retail chargers for used vehicles, all of that helps with that upfront cost that your retail customer is typically gonna be concerned about. Now we recognize there are several constraints in how it was implemented um, and guidance still to come out, we're expecting sometime in March. And so it's important that we understand that, that is clearly communicated to the consumer so they can take advantage of these credits that are available and we can accelerate the deployment that we're all um, expecting and, and uh, needing to achieve some of our, our carbon neutrality goals. Um, but it, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's great that that is, that that is there. Um, and IRA also provides support for domestic manufacturing, um, uh, the production tax, uh, credit investment um, tax credit. So, you know, as Ford is, again, um, we're going to have the battery plants uh, and assembly plants in Texas and Kentucky uh, and the battery plants in Michigan. Um, those credits will be helpful um, in that regard. Um, so there's a lot in in the I, IJA and IRA that uh, we definitely appreciate. Again, Implementation is going to be key. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be helpful to the states as uh, as they uh, go to uh, execute this. You know, be a resource that uh, provide them the support that they need. A lot of these, um, you know, it's the dog that that caught the caught the bus. Um, there's a lot of funding. There's a lot of programs. These the states aren't necessarily staffed up to address this level of funding and um, may not have expertise in how to deploy all of it. So being a resource as, as we implement this, I, I think is critically important. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for, I think about two questions. So is there any, any questions from the audience for our panelists? Thank you. Yep, you, you in the back. Versus Institute. And I have a, had just a question for you, Andre, about um, what, do you think needs to happen 
on the policy front around the workforce development that you talked about on the STEM and said, I mean, I think we all know that, but what, what policy needs to be put in place to make that really pop the way it needs to, because we keep reading about the labor shortages everywhere. Yeah, I, so I, I think what we need um, is better coordination, uh, more resources, and more programs, early education, so that we get, so a couple of things are happening here. We have our current workforce um, that we need to transition into new jobs, but we also need to grow that, that next generation uh, you know, of engineers and uh, scientists, et cetera, to have that interest. So, I mean, there's K through 12 programs that are needed to drive that interest. There's federal coordination, additional funding to uh, uh, D uh, Department of Education, et cetera, that I think it, it is all helpful um, in supporting this labor transition. So appreciate the question. Great. Any Anyone else? I know we don't have a shy bunch here, so who else has got a question? Yep, go ahead. Thanks, hi, Michael Leifman from ERM, and I have a question for Michael. Um, we heard a lot today about permitting and permitting, the need for permitting reform, and on the building side and on the construction side, much of that permitting is extremely local, um, and much of the permitting is actually on the building materials and standards side. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that additional barrier um, both on the buildings materials standards and on local zoning. You know, if you fix federal zoning, fix federal permitting, you don't fix local zoning. Yeah, no, it's a it's a phenomenal question. So, so generally, one hundred percent to your point, right? Most decisions on how things are built is done at the city, county, local level, <clears throat> and it's not until you have a natural disaster that wipes out a whole part of the country, like Southern Florida as an example, that you end up with building codes that actually meet the standards and expectations. So, so I think there's, there's a lot of work that's being done in, in the space to be able to look at building codes, uh, but, but to how do, you, how do you create a platform in the US where those decisions historically have been local uh, to create a, a system where there's now federal oversight. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think we're built uh, for that type of agility in, in the U.S. market. <clears throat> but I do think if you look at the the players that have the potential to make an impact, it's insurance companies, because they have a choice on what they want to insure, how they want to insure it, how things are built. Um, I think in in the resilience space, there's there's a lot of work that's being done. Because uh, because that is a, a critical factor in in those type of investments, and then you have to look at building owners, right? So building owners, if you look at why why is this building a lead, a lead building, it's because the building owners made the decision that they wanted <clears throat> the best quality building, both from a uh, upfront uh, construction uh, process, but through the life cycle of the building. They wanted the best that that you could have in the space, and I think on on the building owner side, there's some capacity to create some momentum in that space as well. Great. Anyone else? Okay. Have one. No. Okay. What I'd like to do as we come to a close is ask our panelists. We've heard a lot from them today in terms of what. Uh, climate policies are necessary uh, for their own companies' advancement of their, of their greenhouse gas production targets. I think it's really what's important to note there is that in many ways, companies push their own limits in terms of what they can achieve, and it's evident where climate policy is needed to advance going forward. At the same time, it's really clear that that collaboration is needed, and Jane, I really appreciated your point about the, that that's the next kind of uh, push. If you could leave the audience with sort of one thought, whether it's um, either how industry can work together or where you'd like to see Congress uh, move, um, I invite you to share that with the audience at the moment. And I'll go popcorn style so that whoever feels most ready can can speak up. Oh. <laughs> go ahead. Well, I don't know. I didn't. I just learned what popcorn style is. Today. Okay. So I, so <laughs> I, it's a very interesting question, Verena, because you know, the more work that I do, at least, and maybe you will see, I always wonder what we're seeing, I think, is more questions around the seams 
the handshakes, the linkages. And everybody's doing a really great job. We're running in our silos and it's a little bit of the friction at the seams and it's just a natural part of the evolution. I'll give you one example and then I'll move on. It's like um, for our customers to bring it back to customers and people, because people always tell me substations are not living things. <laughs> so people, you know, we've got incentives at the state level in many of our jurisdictions. We have incentives at the at the local level, we have incentives, multiple layers of incentives at the federal level, IIJA and then IRA, IRA, sorry, and then other programs. It's very confusing for our customers. And at the end of the day, it has to move customer behavior for this to succeed. So I think one example, and it's not necessarily a policy space as much as it is in that collaboration space, is starting to really everybody care about and focus and simplify our messages for our customers and really help them understand exactly what is available. And I think um, if I were to go cross industry, I would say we do a lot. I even see this in IIJA, a lot of people building out AFCs, alternative fuel corridors in their states with the NEVI money. It'll be interesting to see whether we can build the regional corridors mm -hmm. And we can move across the state and really start building a national network like I think the administration views. We're, we've just become part of the East, this CalStart East Coast um, commercial zero emissions vehicle corridor. But, but it's things like that that I think we're going to need more of that the cross, even within the industry, cross geography and cross sector. And then remember, our customers don't see it by the acts and the laws. They just see it as a purchase decision. And I think those collaborations can really have a virtuous feedback loop to policymakers who can start to see the amplification of industry efforts and those collaborations. Either Andre or Michael, who'd like to go next? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in next. Sorry, Michael. It might be the last word. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. One, um, permit reform. You, you've heard it several times. I just, you know, important note, I, I think, again, if we get that permit reform focus on critical minerals. That helps not just um, our sector, but um, with utilities and the grid, they need copper as well for um, some of the uh, for some of what they need to do. So I think that's important. Agree with uh, Jane completely. We're in the midst of you know one of the biggest transformations um, in in our sector and and how we operate in in you know my lifetime and several lifetimes. And so I think it is important that we help the consumer understand the change that is coming, understand how these new vehicles operate, how charging stations operate, how behavior needs to change. Um, so some of that consumer education, I think, is, uh, is, is also important. Um, and I, I also think an opportunity for collaboration, um, as we think about resilience of the grid and um, electric vehicles, I think there's an opportunity with vehicle to grid um, interface, different pilots that can be done to demonstrate the benefits of that technology. Um, it provides a benefit to the consumer. It provides resilience to the grid. So I think that's another place uh, where there can be some policy work that supports kind of that that build out of that of that capability. Thank you, <clears throat> Michael. To you. Yeah. So maybe I'll I'll say you know I think there's a you you see weave through this right and and through our speakers earlier there's a focus on american competitiveness and uh, i think an area that that congress will work on this year is around carbon border adjustment it fits back into one one of my first policy priorities which was around <clears throat> having a price on carbon and it's a way it's a way to be able to level the playing field between imported products and and products produced domestically I think you also you also have seen kind of weave through this discussion that there's a lot of interdependency. So for for us, we have uh, we have a goal to have our our uh, light vehicle fleet uh, carbon uh, 100% EV by 2030. <clears throat> right right now we have 2,000 F-150s. We have zero F-150 Lightnings. So so the pathway is there, right? We know what it looks like, and then it's. How do we make sure that we have the the uh, the charging infrastructure to be able to make that fleet effective, whether it's uh, uh, vehicles that are in our plants only or vehicles that are on the road? <clears throat> so there's there's a lot of interplay between having the proper generation, having clean generation, having the technology there to be able to utilize it, 
And then step changes, you know, we'll have our first electric ready mix truck this spring in Minneapolis. Um, it's going to be, it'll be interesting to see how that truck is received in the market, mm -hmm. how it operates, how it operates through the winter with, uh, with cold weather impacts. There's a lot of really neat things that are happening and there's a lot of inter interplay uh, uh, across the supply chain, across our our uh, complementary businesses to be able to actually hit the targets that we want to hit by 2025, 2030, 2050. So, so I'm very, I'm very optimistic about uh, about what we can do. And I think, uh, as as a <clears throat> as a member of our our U.S. leadership team, I want to see that investment made here in the U.S. I want to see domestic manufacturing com competitive, and I want to see us decarbonize domestic manufacturing. And, and lead the world in, in that category. So I appreciate the opportunity to close. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna invite Matt up here just in just a moment, but in the meantime, please give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Well, thank you to Michael and Jane and Andre. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna wrap us up with just a few more minutes of um, conclusion. I won't keep folks long. It's been an incredibly rich discussion, but I did want to draw on a few themes. I think that we heard and and bring us bring us to a close. Um, first, I just want to pick up on that business panel, which I which I thought was terrific, and I thought also really captured the vision that C2ES has about working with business to advance the kind of policies we'll need. All of the companies we heard from, Wholesome US, Exelon, Ford Motor, those they. We heard about their ambitious climate commitments and the ambitious targets you've set. And we also know that you won't be able to do that entirely on your own. You're going to, the companies are going to need the enabling policy frameworks, the smart and effective and ambitious policies, some of which we've got so far, but many of which we still need. And we need that implementation. And so reaching those commitments that you've set, I think is going to be part, partly a matter of the policies that we need to see in place. And we look forward to that partnership and, and, and the interdependency as well among, among the companies, among the sectors that Michael mentioned. Um, it's going to take heavy industry. It's going to take cement. It's going to take more transmission and electric power. And it's going to take electric vehicles. It's going to take the entire economy. And I think that's something that we also always keep in mind at C2ES. The second thing I want to mention is just how much resonance there was, I think, between what we heard consistently throughout the day uh, or throughout the morning uh, and the kind of policy agenda that we've identified in our brief and that you'll see uh, detailed in the report. And I don't think that's a surprise because we worked so closely with so many of our, our businesses, but I do think we, we saw that again and again, the emphasis on permitting, on transmission. Uh, on critical minerals and uh, and the supply chains there, but also on new technologies. We heard about the importance of hydrogen. Uh, we heard about advanced nuclear. We heard about carbon capture use and storage and the need for the infrastructure and the CO2 pipelines to get that done. Um, of course, we heard about transmission and permitting again and again, but we also heard about workforce development and the need to invest in communities. And all of that is captured in that uh, in the in the report that we're releasing today and that and that folks will have seen. Um, and so finally, I just want to return to a couple of the initial themes. Uh, we said at the beginning, and I think we've heard it throughout, so much has been done in the past couple of years, and that's really important to celebrate and and uh, and build on. And yet there's so much more to be done, which I think is what we we heard a lot. and and we can't simply rest on our laurels or check the box to say, we've, we've, we've done climate, now we can move on. And we heard a lot of what that needs to happen, but, but I think there's, it's really a, a, a brief for all of us and an agenda for all of us to get done. Uh, we also heard so much about the economic opportunity. Um, I loved what An Andre said toward the end, the enormous transformation we're in the middle of. Uh, and that presents challenges and we've got to manage those transitions, but it also presents enormous economic opportunity. And, and I think a lot of what we're seeing in the policy recommendations is how to capture that, the investment, the innovation, the workforce development, the domestic supply chains, all of that will help both meet our targets, uh, our 2030 targets and 2050 goals, but also build the economy. And so this policy agenda that we've laid out with the help of so many companies, including some of those here and uh, here today, it's really an agenda for 
uh, the Biden administration and for Congress, um, and an agenda for all of us to work on over the next coming, uh, the next couple of years and the years beyond that, not only to ensure the effective implementation of what we've got, but to build on it in a way that can meet our targets and, and grow the economy. Um, so with that, let me uh, thank all of you who are in the room. Let me thank, uh, we had more than 180 folks joining us online. So thanks to those of you who are online, if you're still there. Um, let me thank our panelists, Michael Lamans, Jane Park, and Andre Welch. I wanna thank Pedro Pizarro of Edison International for giving that great keynote. And then of course, uh, thank Cong uh, our representative, Scott Peters from California and Marionette Miller Meeks from Iowa. Um, thanks again to all of you. We look forward to working with all of you on this policy agenda over the next couple of years. And with that, I will bring us to the close and uh, we can enjoy some more of the snacks outside. Thanks very much.